So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, my name is Dr. Janet Rosenzweig. I have the privilege of serving as the Executive Director of APSAC, of the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children. And APSAC is all about bringing resources to the profession, to those of us that devote our careers to strengthening families and working with uh, vulnerable children and families, particularly who've been involved with maltreatment. Um, APSAC is a membership society. We are proud to say that we now have about 1,800 members, doubled in the last five years. If you are not a member, we encourage you to join. Um, many of our events, like the one today, are open to any member of the profession that are, that are interested, but we've also got some special member-only events and member-only benefits and of course, APSAC um, relies on member dues to help us uh, operate. Uh, we've got a couple of exciting things coming up that I'd like to make sure folks know about. We are right now offering a certificate program on el eliminating systemic racism and implicit bias in child welfare. Um, we've had a, the first two sessions have taken place, but additional ones are planned and there's still enough left to earn the certificate. We encourage you to check out our website at appsac.org and learn more about those. In fact, the first sessions have been recorded and are available on our learning management system. So that very important material is available for you. We'll have a certificate series on medical issues and health issues and child maltreatment starting in 2021. We offer, we're very proud to offer an online course that has served hundreds of people. It is eight modules with 29 lectures. And we encourage you to consider that. And particularly to think if you've got colleagues in your organization that might be relatively new to the field or maybe know one aspect of the field, but they don't know you know, the whole way the system operates, that's a really wonderful introduction. And if anybody wants to take that course, we offer a discount code for people that are here today. And if they're interested in the APSAC Foundling online course, you can use the discount code webinar10 and get a 10% discount off of that registration. We're offering forensic interview training clinics that we encourage you to share that news with folks in your organizations that do forensic interviewing. And next year, we're already planning a phenomenal webinar series where we will have eight national experts, each presenting on an important topic. And we'll be offering an eight-week course, all very reasonably priced, most with different continuing ed credits. So we encourage you to learn more about APSAC, learn more about our educational offerings. And if you're not a member, really consider joining us. If you'd like to join us in a way that might be a little bit more fun than work, we're currently doing a fundraiser called the APSAC NEK hashtag A-P-S-A-C-A-N-Y-K. And our motto is 1K, 5K, 10K, any K, get out there and walk for a cause. So please go to Facebook and search for that hashtag, hashtag APSAC any K, and consider becoming part of our uh, unique or, uh, effort to get yourself healthy, get out there and get some steps in and to support APSAC. And without further ado, uh, we all know that APSAC operates because of the hard work of our board and staff. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you, Dr. Mel Schneiderman, the Vice President of the Board of APSAC. Thank you, Janet. Um, and I'm very happy to introduce Guy Stevens, uh, who will be uh, the uh, speaker today. Guy Stevens is a father, a husband, and an advocate for children's rights. His journey in advocacy began as a parent advocating for appropriate accommodations and support for his autistic son. Guy has been advocating for change related to the use of restraint and seclusion in schools after his son was restrained, secluded, and traumatized in a, Mer uh, in a Maryland public school. Guy is the founder and executive director for the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint. Uh, the mission of AASR, is to educate the public and connect people who are dedicated to changing minds, laws, policies, and practices so that restraint and seclusion are reduced and eliminated from schools across the nation. 
AAS, AASR believes that our schools should be moving towards neurodevelopmentally informed, trauma-sensitive, biologically respectful, relationship-based ways of understanding and supporting all students. Guy is currently a member of the Board of Directors for the Arc of Maryland. Guy is a member of the Council of Parents, of Parent Attorneys and Advocates. Recently, Guy has been presenting at national conferences and events to support the message that we need to embrace neurodiversity and neuroscience to create safe and inclusive environments to ensure equal rights and opportunities for all. Uh, Guy, thank you very much for uh, presenting today and it's all yours. Absolutely, thank you Mel for the introduction, I appreciate it. Uh, so let me go ahead and get my screen shared and then we will get things started here. So I'm sure that um, like me, that all of you um, probably have a little bit of Zoom fatigue. We, we've had a lot of uh, a lot of meetings on Zoom in this this new world, and uh, I'll try to try to keep this informative and hopefully um, you know move through this fairly quickly to to give you some valuable information. Um, so as Mel said, I'm going to be talking about restraint and seclusion, and the topic today is breaking the cycle because restraint and seclusion really are something that can end up being a cycle. Uh, where they're being used in traumatizing children. So we're going to talk about kind of the case for ending restraint and seclusion. And, and more importantly, what can we do, be doing that's better? And before I get into the presentation, I'll, I'll just say to you, the first time I heard the words restraint and seclusion in relation to a school, it was kind of a surprise to me. It was never a thing that I would have imagined happening inside of a uh, of school, much less a, a public school. Um, so at any rate, um, you know, I don't know where people are coming from or what background you might have in this, uh, but I'm gonna try to give some background for those of you that may not be familiar with this and try to provide some additional information as well. So let me begin. Uh, and I'm just gonna run over our agenda here real quickly to note, let you know what we're gonna talk about. Uh, we're gonna have some introductions and some background. Uh, I'm gonna talk about what restraint and seclusion are, why they're used, and really the consequences of using restraint and seclusion. We'll talk a little bit about the school to prison pipeline, uh, the legal landscape, and bottom line is that we can do better and we wanna talk about how we can be doing better. And finally, we'll have some time for questions and answers. So I'm gonna to try to have most of the questions and answers at the end. Um, if there's anything that, that is really urgent that you wanna uh, interject, then uh, you know I'll ask the uh, one of the moderators to keep an eye out and we can uh, tackle that as well. But just to make sure we get all through all of the material today. So a little bit of an introduction and Mel gave a great introduction. So I don't think I need to say too much more. I always start by saying I'm a father because that's what my entry point into this was. Uh, I was not on a mission to um, become an advocate. Um, I had always advocated for my son, uh, but when something happened to our family and I realized what was happening beyond our situation throughout the state, throughout the country, I knew I needed to do more. And that's what led me to form this group, the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint. Uh, you know, again, we strongly believe that we can do better. And if we can do better, that we should do better. So I started this organization in March of 2019. Uh, this was following our own personal story of the use of restraint and seclusion. And I started the group initially because when it happened to my family, um, I knew what happened shouldn't have happened. And I began doing research. And the more research I did, the more concerned I became about the issue of restraint and seclusion. And as I began to do that research, I realized it wasn't easy to find this information. And I started the Alliance initially as a way to share information and provide resources to others that were going through these situations. Very quickly, I connected with other parents and other, other individuals that had either gone through this or had family members that had gone through this, or even were teachers or um, administrators in schools that, that these kinds of things were happening. And our goals began to evolve. It wasn't just that we wanted to provide information, but we wanted to provide support for people as well uh, that were going through this because it can be very isolating when you have a, a child uh, that goes through something like this, it can be really isolating. And even uh, you know, parents that you may have talked to about other issues related to your children before may not relate to this at all. So we started the organization because we wanted people to know that they weren't alone and also that they could influence a change. And we encourage people to try to make change, whether in their local community, across their state, or even nationally. So we developed a website, we have a mission, and we continue to kind of grow from here. Uh, oops, I went one slide too far there. Um, our mission is about education. We wanna educate the public and connect people together. 
that are really dedicated to changing minds, laws, policies, and practices so that restraint and seclusion are reduced and eliminated in schools across the nation and beyond. And I'll tell you, it, it really is beyond. Um, I had a conversation earlier today with a professor in the uh, UK um, talking to a, a school administrator this evening from Australia. You know, we see these things happening all across the uh, all across the world. So we want to try to influence positive change related to that. And our, our network in just the, a little over a year and a half, we've got about 10,000 followers on social media, uh, mainly parents, uh, advocates, self-advocates, attorneys, educators, and others. Uh, we also have a team of seven volunteers. We're a grassroots volunteer organization. And we're, again, trying to influence a positive change. We've got some exciting work coming up, and I'll just kind of tease this before we get into the, the main part of the presentation. We're working on tools to help people to advocate for change in the form of an advocacy handbook. I'm working with a filmmaker right now in Seattle on a documentary to raise awareness about the use of restraint and seclusion. And we're also supporting legislation. Uh, the Keeping All Students Safe Act was recently reintroduced. We'll talk a little more about that throughout the presentation. So the important thing, why did I, why did I start down this road and why am I oddly uh, in front of you today and, and sharing um, you know, some of our story? And, and I did this because I have this amazing son named Cooper. He's now 15. Um, he loves science. He loves nature. His latest hobby, he likes to, uh, he, he likes to cut wood and split wood. And he, he's discovered the art of chainsaw milling and is making his own lumber. So he's, a, he's an amazing kid. Uh, unfortunately, he had some unfortunate instances of restraint and seclusion. Uh, he is autistic and has ADHD and as a result needed additional supports throughout school. And unfortunately, in the fifth grade, he suffered his first instances of being restrained. And it was a really unfortunate situation. He had been working with a particular teacher for about two and a half years. Um, he had gone from a self-contained classroom to being in the general education setting for all but one of his classes by the fifth grade, was doing really well, was on a, a great path. And that teacher got in a car accident. When that happened, uh, he had a lot of difficulty and we saw behaviors emerge we hadn't seen for four or five years. And he, there were two situations where he eloped, he, he, he left the classroom, he hid in a bathroom, overwhelmed and ultimately came out of the bathroom only to be physically restrained, drugged down a hallway and thrown into an empty room. This happened to him um, within a week, two times, and I went to the school the second time to get him, and I had never seen him so distraught. He had thrown things, knocked things over, tried to climb out the window. Um, that physical restraint was really, really difficult and traumatizing. In fact, so much so that we ended up homeschooling for the next two years because he did not want to go back to school. Only to return two years later after really advocating to get him appropriate supports to return to a public school system and have it happen again. He was restrained. We, we got him back in in the eighth grade because he wanted to go back to public school to be around his friends. And we got him into a program. We talked about this issue. We talked about the right way to work with him and should have never happened. But over 15 days that he was back in that placement, he was restrained and or secluded at least four times. And again, didn't want to go back to school. We got, you know, we had to get therapy. We had to have home and hospital schooling for him. And at that point, I made a promise to him that, you know, this should never have happened to him. And I was going to do anything in my power to make sure it didn't happen to him or others like him again. So, you know, my motivation in doing this has been to support my son, who is now in a really good placement and doing really well and uh, thriving. Um, but, you know, just having ourselves safe, you know, we knew we couldn't just move on from this. We wanted to address the issue and try to help others that were going through this as well. So that is my motivation. And I will ask you if you would in the chat, and I may not have a chance to look at this right away, but if you would, you know, in the chat, tell me who you are, where you're from and why you're interested in this topic. I'd love to love to see those comments uh, in the chat and kind of get a sense of, of where you're from. Um, and also if you're familiar with this issue, um, you know, as I said, the first time I heard restraint and seclusion in the context of a school, it was a surprise to me. I would have never imagined these kinds of things happening in a school setting. So tell me about yourself in the chat. And as you do, I'll continue to, to move forward. And I'm going to talk about the issue of restraint and seclusion. And I want to begin by going through some definitions. And I'll tell you the definitions that I'm using today are definitions from federal guidance. And the reason I'm using the federal guidance definitions is that uh, you are likely in different states across the, the country and you may have different state laws and different definitions. This federal guidance was issued in 2012. 
um, and has been widely adopted by many states, but not all. So what is, what is physical restraint? And of course, the first thing I'll say to you is it's exactly what it sounds like. If you were to imagine a, a, law, a law enforcement situation where somebody is, is taken to the ground and held down, that's a restraint. And these kind of things can happen in our schools as well. A physical restraint by definition is an immobilization. So it's you know putting your arms uh, around someone, holding them so that they can't move freely. They can't move their, their torso, their arms, their legs, or their head freely. Uh, there are different kinds of restraints, and I'll show you a few of those in a moment. Uh, of course, there is training offered in the use of restraint, um, but restraint is a physical immobilization. You're, you're holding someone, and we'll get to why in a moment. Now, it does not mean the same thing as a physical escort, and an escort is a very temporary thing. It's a touching or a holding of the hand or wrist. This is not a forceful holding. It should be a very gentle thing to guide a student who's acting out to a safe location. There is a blurry line between the two at times, and oftentimes restraints are happening when in fact escorts are recorded, which is a bit problematic. So what does restraint look like? There are standing restraints. In a standing restraint, it could be a single adult or multiple adults behind a child, often taking their arms in, you know, kind of in front of their body, crossing their chest and, and holding them in such a way that they would be deemed not to be dangerous to themselves or others. That's one form of restraint. There are seated forms of restraint where one or more adults may use their own body to position someone in a seated position. And again, this is not being done willfully by the child. The child is resisting, um, but you know somebody would be helping to get them down into a seated position. There are supine restraints. And you know if you look at the definition, it starts with a takedown. So this is exactly what you think it is. People are taking a you know, child down to the ground and securing their arms and legs in a supine position, it's usually going to be in the uh, face-up orientation versus a prone restraint, which is a face-down. And prone restraints, you, you may have heard of before in, in, in this context or others, uh, because they have resulted in the death of children and adults uh, because they can affect the ability to breathe. So a prone restraint is a face-down restraint that begins again with a takedown. These are illegal in some states, not all states. So that's restraint, and we're gonna talk about why it's used in a moment, but let me move on to, again, give some definitions here. And I wanna define seclusion. And, and I'm gonna emphasize some words here because they're really important. Seclusion is the involuntary confinement. So it's, it's against the child's will of a student alone in a room or area from which they're physically prevented from leaving. So again, it is involuntary. More often than not in a seclusion, a child is being put in that area against their will. It is involuntary and they are alone and they cannot leave. Now seclusion, there's a, a host of reasons it's used. It's often used because a child is deemed to be dangerous. And the idea is that we will put them in a room by themselves and they will magically calm down. Um, unfortunately, the reality is far different. You can see in this photograph here, this was a real case from Maryland young man had actually banged his head and, and was, there's blood at the edge of the door there. Um, I will say to you that being thrown in a room against your will and being refused the ability to leave is in no way calming. Um, I've learned in my life that even just telling someone to calm down is not effective as you probably all can relate, but being thrown into a space against your area certainly is not. Now a timeout is not, this, excuse me, a, a seclusion is not the same as a timeout which is more of a um, behavior management technique where a child's not alone, they're not in a locked setting, they're not prevented from leaving. They may be segregated from the class, but they're not being put in there against their will and prevent from leaving. So that's seclusion. And I do wanna make the, the distinction that seclusion, my keyboard is jumping ahead here. Um, you know, People will often say, well, what about, what about a break room or a sensory room? And, and there are rooms that are sometimes used. Um, children with disabilities, autism, ADHD, and others may find it useful to have a sensory room or an amygdala reset area within the classroom, a place where a child might be able to take a, a break if they need one, uh, self-directed or even directed by a, a teacher if they're not being put in there against their will uh, and, and to help regulate. Maybe they need some quiet, you know, quiet space. Um, and you know we've never had an issue with with that type of situation where a child, in fact, needs a break. Uh, what we have an issue with is when they're being forcefully put in there against their will and prevented the ability to leave. And the problem is, is that seclusion rooms very often have very, um, you know, very innocent sounding names like the cool room or the break room or the calm down room or the blue room. 
Uh, the quiet room, you know, having a nice name for a room doesn't make it less traumatic. And, and we're going to talk about trauma because that's a big part of this as well. So sensory rooms are a little bit different if used appropriately. Now, knowing what restraint and seclusion are, when are these intended to be used? And if you look at the federal guidance again, the federal guidance says, you know, you shouldn't be using these things unless there's a situation that is a crisis and the child's behavior is so escalated that it poses an imminent danger of serious physical harm to either themselves or somebody else. And you wanna avoid this to the greatest extent possible. So the language here is really important. And, and of course I have this in red, imminent danger of serious physical harm, because that means something. Now, in my own, in, in my own experience, uh, I actually worked through helping to change a policy in our local school system. And, and people told me at first that they didn't know what serious physical harm meant. Now, of course, I pointed them to definitions, um, but you know, people were often of the mind that, well, gee, you know, what, what serious physical harm means to you and me might be different. And I would say, no, imminent serious physical harm has a definition. And it actually means the same thing as serious bodily injury, which is actually defined in the Individual with Disabilities Education Act and other, other legal precedences. And imminent serious physical harm means there is a substantial risk of death. This is a life or death injury. This is not something more minor. It's a life or death injury that could cause extreme physical pain, protracted and obvious disfigurement, or a protracted loss or impairment of a function or bodily organ or mental faculty. This is serious. You should not be using these things unless it meets this criteria. Unfortunately, that's not what happens in practice. Um, although it's very clear that imminent serious physical harm is a life or death situation, what I find more often than not are these things are used in situations that don't involve a life or death uh, situation, but rather maybe it's a minor injury, a kick, a bite, a bruise, or a scratch. Maybe it's as punishment, which the guidance is very clear. These things should not be used as punishment. Very often it's about non-compliance. The child is not, and, and you know, we see the same thing in, in education and law enforcement settings. There's a there's a desire for compliance that often leads to an approach that escalates rather than de-escalates situations. We see this happen in the classroom all the time where a well-intentioned but perhaps inappropriately trained staff member is actually escalating the situation and making it worse. Um, these things shouldn't be used for convenience or disrespect or bad language, uh, even property damage. And there's a reason the bar is so high and we'll talk about that in just a moment. So. Um, oops, let me forward on my slide here and we're doing two at a time here still. Um, so why shouldn't we do these things? And oops, let me go back here. Why shouldn't we do these things? Um, I'm going to talk about, but I want to share with you some real life incidences here as well. You know, so we know what that bar is, imminent serious physical harm, life or death. My son was once put in a seclusion room and restrained for splashing water. Uh, I know other kids that were restrained or secluded, uh, one for flipping the light switch off and on and not complying to demands that, that stop, uh, cleaning up their desk. There are a lot of reasons that kids end up being restrained or secluded that do not meet the criteria that's set forth in the federal guidance or oftentimes in the case of state law. I live in a state that has strong laws in Maryland, which say we should be using imminent serious physical harm, yet it still happened to my son in a situation that didn't warrant that. So let's talk about the impact from the use of restraint and seclusion. One of the things that we know is that this can lead to, the use of these things can lead to trauma, injury, and even death. And while they're intended as crisis management procedures, there are risks. Um, one of the things that really upsets me is when I hear people say, well, gee, we're trained in safe restraint because there is no such thing as safe restraint. Now, there is reducing risk. You can be trained in techniques that are going to reduce risk, but a restraint by its nature is never safe. And the reason that is, is that when you are physically restrained or someone is physically restrained, they will enter into a fight or flight response mode, most likely. And in that mode, they will fight back. And when, when a child, even a very small child is fighting back, there's the chance that someone is going to get hurt. Additionally, the teacher or the staff involved will probably likely also go into a fight or flight mode. So you're really just getting the adrenaline pumping and increasing the likelihood that someone is going to get hurt. But let's talk first about the impact of trauma. And trauma has a significant impact on the brain. And again, I don't know everyone's background here, 
Uh, I learned more about trauma in the last two years than I ever would have uh, ever would have thought I would learn. Um, but it became very important to understanding what was happening here. And, and one of the first lessons I learned is that you know, trauma can actually impact and affect changes in the brain. So we have certain structures in our brain that can, can show changes and our reactions can show changes due to traumatic experience. And that in itself can make it more likely that people that have been through trauma or people with a diagnosis of a uh, you know, PTSD or, or related diagnoses may find themselves in what we would call a hypervigilant state. And I'm gonna explain that a little bit more in the next slide as we talk about um, as we talk about, and I don't know why we keep doing two slides here, the trauma cycle. So the first thing to keep in mind in our schools is that many of the kids that are restrained and secluded are children with disabilities, black and brown children, children that have a trauma history, and boys. And often, despite the, despite the image many people get when they think about restraint and seclusion, it's often our very youngest students. We're talking about pre-K, kindergarten, first grade students that are being restrained and secluded. Those students who are deemed to be so threatening that they're presenting imminent serious physical harm. I've met many of these kids who are very small and it's hard to imagine a situation where they might be posing that. But at any rate, so what's the issue here as it relates to trauma? That is that many kids have a trauma background. Uh, and if kids have a trauma background, they may already be in a situation where they're a bit in a hypervigilant state. They're scanning their environment for danger because they have trauma that they've suffered at home or in other situations, they may be in that hypervigilant state. And as a result of being in a hypervigilant state, they're more likely into, to engage in what we refer to as distress behaviors. Because they are on alert, something may be harder for them that would be easier for someone else. And they be, may become overwhelmed and triggered. So when we get distressed behavior, how does a staff member respond to that? Are they empathetic? Are they trying to help the child? Or might they begin to place demands on the child? Very often in a situation in the classroom, a situation that leads to behaviors may lead to compliance demands. And those compliance demands don't help to kind of cool down the amygdala of the child, the portion of the brain that responds in flight or sight, flight or flight situations, sorry. Um, but can rather escalate the situation. And we often see demands being placed on the child. They're unable to meet them. The behavior escalates. They enter into a fight or flight or freeze mode. And then what happens? Well, they might get restrained. They might get secluded. They might get suspelled or expended. I, I, ex, ex, sorry, my, my, my words are not coming out as always intended. Expelled or suspended. And, and that can lead to re-traumatization. So we really end up with a cycle where, where kids become more traumatized. And one of the issues with the use of restraint and seclusion is that it can in itself lead to a greater need to use restraint or seclusion, which is not resolving problems. So again, trauma is really important in thinking about restraint and seclusion. Now, of course, the other downfall here are injuries. Kids are injured. We have broken bones, head trauma, scratches, bruises, seizures, brain injuries. Uh, there was a case that led to an amputation. Uh, the young man in this picture here, his name is Carson Luke. Uh, he's now, I believe, 20 years old. And he, he had his hand broken and foot broken being put into a, a seclusion room against his will. And to this day, at 20 years old, he cannot sleep with the door shut. Uh, you know, he was traumatized and this trauma lives on with kids. Uh, I know another young man that will, if he drives by his school, he will vomit. Uh, the trauma is so real to, to children that, that get put through these situations. So physical injuries, of course, are, are a concern. And it's not just the students. It's also teachers, staff, and caregivers. Um, you know, I've got a couple quotes here from teachers. I've been punched in the face more times than I could remember. I've been hit in the head with chairs. When you're done, it's exhausting. It's a rare day that you don't get hurt at all takes a toll on us. There's no one really to talk to. So we know this is also rough on the teachers and staff. Um, but, you know, in addition to trauma, injuries, there have been far too many deaths due to the use of restraint and seclusion. Uh, the young man here is a young man named Cornelius Frederick. Uh, on April 29th of this year, he was at a, a school in Kalamazoo, Michigan, called the Lakeside Academy. It's a residential facility. He was in the cafeteria and he threw a piece of a sandwich across the table at another child. 
At that point, the staff responded by restraining, tackling him to the ground and restraining him for 12 minutes. There were seven men involved in the restraint and it led to his death. He died uh, a day, two days later in the hospital and the medical examiner ruled it a homicide. This should never have occurred. And again, that behavior, throwing a sandwich, that was not imminent serious physical harm. Uh, it was a matter of compliance or minor behavior. And, and today he is no longer with us. He's not the only one, you know, Max Benson, a young man, 13 year old uh, in um, California died after being held in a prone restraint by his staff at a school in California. Michael Renner Lewis, uh, his first day of school, he had a seizure. He became uh, agitated after the seizure. Uh, he was restrained and that led to his death. Um, you know, Angelica Arn, Corey Foster, Jonathan King, uh, he was in a seclusion room in Georgia and he hung himself in the seclusion room. So these things really have a dire effect. And we've known this for a long time. This is not new news to us. You can look at the dates on these. Uh, but even going back to 2009, the Government Accountability Office did a report about death and injuries related to the use of restraint and seclusion. This should not be happening. And, and the, frankly, there are better things that we can be doing. There, there are things that we can be doing to reduce and eliminate these practices. Now, there's also an issue of disproportionality with the use of restraint or seclusion. If you have a disability or black or brown, you're more likely to be restrained or secluded. Uh, if you are an elementary school student, you are more likely to be restrained or secluded. You know, some stats here, students with disabilities, 200 times more likely to be restrained and secluded. Uh, black students, 200 times more likely than their uh, white counterparts. Hispanic students, 45% more likely than their white counterparts. Uh, and, you know, what we find is that this is data from the most recent um, report from the Office of Civil Rights, the so Department of Education Office of Civil Rights. They released the report uh, about two months ago. This is the 2017-2018 data. Prior to that, the most recent data was 2014-2015. So we do have a bit of an issue with the Office of Civil Rights getting their data to us in a timely way. But they released this data and it shows that 80% of their physical restraints are children with disabilities. 77% of the seclusions are children with disabilities. Uh, I have a term for this and I call it discrimination, but there's very obviously a problem going on here. So if we look at race, uh, black students, uh, they are again, disproportionately um, restrained and secluded. Uh, if you look at their, the percentage that they are in, in the enrollment versus the rate of restraint and seclusion. So we definitely see issues here with disproportionality. And again, all of these things collectively can lead us down what we refer to as the school to prison pipeline. And the school to prison pipeline is a uh, term that refers to these policies and practices that really can indirectly and directly kind of push students out of school and down the pathway to referral to law enforcement, to criminal justice, uh, you know, schools, to all sorts of things. And they also lead our, to changes in our schools as well that make them begin to take on more of a prison-like environment. So when schools begin diverting students into the criminal justice system, we see a lot of a lot of issues. And a lot of this came around things like zero tolerance policies, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, you know, following Columbine, there were a lot of policies put in place that that would have zero tolerance and very defined consequences. And the 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 result of that is that we saw, you know, there was a review that looked at more than 30,000 um, instances of school suspension and expulsion for nonviolent and non-criminal offenses. And they included things like suspending a student for four months for sharpening his pencil without permission and giving the teacher a threatening look when asked to sit down. Um, somebody that um, was expelled for um, the rest of the school year for poking another student with a ballpoint pen during an exam. Uh, expelling a student permanently because of their possession of an antibiotic uh, that violated their um, zero tolerance policy. You know, calling the police in and handcuffing students uh, that started a snowball fight. So again, we see these policies and, and you know, these exclusionary and discipline policies aren't benefiting the children. You know, a child that is having a hard time needs help, doesn't need to be suspended or expelled. Um, so we need better ways to, to work with and support children. So again, you know, we're finding that, um, you know, this again, disproportionately impacts African-American students. Uh, who are overrepresented not only in the school to prison pipeline, but also uh, in school discipline for over 40 years. So there's a lot of data out there that, that covers this. Um, and you can look at some of that. This is from a report from the Children's Defense Fund. You know, a black boy born in 2001 had a one in three chance of going to prison in his lifetime. 
a Latino boy, one in six, a white boy, one in 17. A uh, black girl born in 2001 had a one in 17 chance of going to prison in her lifetime versus Latino at one in 45 or a white girl at one in 111. So we definitely see differences there when looking at that. And of course, you know, the issue of police in our schools is one that's come up a lot recently. Uh, and, and I'm not here to, to advocate for a particular solution, but I do want to point out clearly that there is a problem. And that problem is that we have many schools across the nation that have police, but don't have other important supports in place. You know, for instance, uh, you know, we find that many schools across the nation have police, but don't have counselors. In fact, 1.7 million students are in schools with police, but no counselors. 3 million students are in schools with police, but no nurses. 6 million students are in schools with police, but and no psychologists. 10 million in schools with police, but no social workers. And it goes on. So there are certainly issues with a pro providing appropriate supports for students, which then lead to interventions from law enforcement. And we ultimately end up with what we refer to as the school to prison pipeline when law enforcement gets involved in what would have been previously behavior that would have been managed by the school staff. Uh, law enforcement gets involved and we end up with schools that are, you know, sending kids to, uh, you know, uh, for criminal co uh, consequences for things that otherwise would have been handled by, you know, by schools themselves. I did want to recommend here, if you've not seen this, there's a documentary called The Kids We Lose. Uh, this is on the topic of restraint and seclusion and also kind of getting into the school to prison pipeline. Uh, it was a film done by Dr. Ross Green's organization called Lives in the Balance. And it's a, a full length documentary that kind of talks about the human side of how restraint, seclusion, behavior um, can all affect children and families. So I would recommend that you check that out when you have some time. And uh, let's talk now about the legal landscape. So there are currently no federal laws in place related to the use of restraint and seclusion in schools. We do have federal guidance, but we do not have federal law. Now that's not because it hasn't been discussed. Uh, a federal tension began back in 2009 and there was in fact an effort to pass the Preventing Harmful Restraint and Seclusion uh, in Schools Act. Uh, that was introduced, unfortunately that did not pass. And subsequently there have been other attempts to pass federal legislation which have not passed. I believe looking at the disproportionality issue and looking at the uh, potential discrim discriminatory issues here that we absolutely should have federal law. But I also believe that federal law alone does not stop this problem. Uh, in fact, what we need to do is focus on solutions and getting the tools to educators because we know there's a lot of educators that don't you do this. We know there's a lot of schools that don't do this, but we know there's others that it's part of their culture. It's the tool that's in their toolbox. So we know that can change, but law alone is a step in the right direction, but ultimately we have to get changes in effect that can help support staff to work with children in better ways. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, some of this effort started back in 2009, over a decade ago. The Government Accountability Office did a report uh, that looked at seclusion and restraint, and it was called Selected Cases of Death and Abuse at Public and Private Schools and Treatment Centers. And they found hundreds of cases of alleged abuse and death related to the use of restraint and seclusion. They, of course, recognized that there was no law. And, and this report led to a, a great deal of activity on this topic. But again, it did not push things over the line. And, you know, I, I've, I've read this report and there are stories in there that are very upsetting of, of what has happened to children. Uh, and again, many cases of, of death and significant injury. So that started things, um, you know, kind of moving to discuss this issue more. And as a response, you know, we didn't get a federal law, but in 2012, the Department of Education put out a document called Restraint and Seclusion Resource Document. And it was their best guidance at the time of what they thought that school systems should take into account when considering restraint and seclusion. It was really intended, I think, to be somewhat of a blueprint for states that wanted to create uh, laws or policies around the use of restraint and seclusion. This document also was known as the 15 principles document, and it goes through 15 principles related to the use of restraint and seclusion. This is where we saw the introduction of language like, you know, we don't want to use these things, physical restraint or seclusion, except in situations where the child's behavior poses imminent danger of serious, har serious physical harm. 
uh, to themselves or someone else. You know, this was one of the strong pieces of guidance that came out of this. It was a um, well, um, you know, it was a well done um, document that had a lot of valuable information in some states then modeled their laws after what the federal guidance recommended. Some did not, some still do not have laws related to the use of restraint and seclusion. In 2014, the Senate issued a report and they said that there is no evidence that physically restraining or putting children in unsupervised seclusion in the K through 12 school system provides any educational or therapeutic benefit to a child. In fact, the use of seclusion or restraint in non-emergency situations poses significant physical and psychological danger to students. We've known this since 2014 and before. And in fact, the 90s were the decade of the brain. You know, we learned more in the 90s about the brain and about trauma than the, 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 the decades leading up till then. And, you know, we know more now and we should know more and do better. But a lot of our, um, a lot of our schools, oftentimes the knowledge doesn't move quickly. You know, we're still doing things we did 25 years ago um, when in fact we know better practices exist out there. Moving on in 2016, the U.S. Department of Education again offered guidance, this time in the form of a dear colleague letter from the Office of Civil Rights. So very obviously, the Department of Education was concerned about this. And in their guidance, they talked about the fact that the use of restraint and seclusion could have such a traumatic impact on a student that even if it only happened once, even if they were only restrained or secluded once, it could lead to new academic and behavioral difficulties that if not addressed promptly, could result in a denial of a free and appropriate public education. So this is the Department of Education saying, we realize there are implications here under IDEA or under the Individuals with Disability Education Act. This is serious guidance. And it goes on to provide guidance to help school districts navigate and make sure that they're not violating, violating civil rights. So moving forward, I mentioned the Office of Civil Rights collects data. Since 2009, they've collected data on the use of restraint and seclusion. Every two years, they collect the data and they put it out on their website and in a report. Now, I will be somewhat critical of the Department of um, Education's Office of Civil Rights in that one, they don't get the data processed very quickly. Uh, as I mentioned, we now have the 2017-2018 data that we got about a month and a half ago Prior to that, here we were in 2020 and our latest data was 2014, 2015. They don't seem to respond proactively to the data. They respond to complaints that are filed. And we have the technology now that we should be analyzing data and responding where we see trends and issues. They are not doing that. I am also critical, uh, I mean, of a very simple thing. Looking at the report here, here we have a, this is the cover of their report with a diverse group of smiling children on a report about restraint and seclusion, a practice that kills and traumatizes kids. Uh, you know, I think we need to be doing better at the, our Office of Civil Rights, and we've been in contact with folks to invest, you know, to encourage a GAO uh, investigation to, to do better. We need timely, relevant data to be able to make decisions. So this report tells us that over 101,000 kids were restrained and secluded in, in public schools in the nation. And while we know that 16% of all students are students with disabilities, as I mentioned previously, 80% of the physical restraints and 77% of the seclusions were children with disabilities. That's astronomical. And of course, black and brown children are also disproportionately impacted by restraint and seclusion. So we need to do better. And that's not just my opinion. In fact, uh, there was a report from the Government Accountability Office earlier this year criticizing the data that we were getting from the Office of Civil Rights. Uh, there was an instance where it was determined that we had a lot of school districts reporting zero incidences of restraint and seclusion, when in fact it wasn't true. Uh, Fairfax County, Virginia was one that was reporting zero instances. And in fact, they are, they are uh, part of a lawsuit now that's been filed against them. And they later came out and said, oh, gee, uh, it was a mistake. We, we didn't report the data appropriately. But there's, no, there's been no um, consequence to that in terms of uh, filing data that was incorrect. So the GAO has asked for the Department of Education to put priority to that issue of data. So some good news here. As I alluded to earlier, the Keeping All Students Safe Act has been reintroduced. Uh, now, this is not the first time that it's been introduced. Uh, we are supporting the Keeping All Students Safe Act and trying to work with uh, lawmakers to see that it gets passed. 
this bill would prohibit the use of seclusion and it would substantially reduce the use of restraint and also dangerous forms of restraint. And it's, a, it's designed to equip schools with the necessary training to, to help do this as well. So Keeping All Students Safe Act was reintroduced. It will be reintroduced at the beginning of the next Congress. Um, you know, I don't know where people are from, but if you're at an organization that is interested in this topic, I would certainly encourage you to consider endorsing the bill. Uh, we have endorsed the bill. Um, you know, it is like any legislation, probably not perfect, but it is certainly a step in the right direction. If you're interested in this from a state by state standpoint, which you might be, and you're interested in learning more about what the laws look like in your individual state, you're always welcome to reach out to me and I'm happy to provide you any information that I have. But I'll also encourage you, there's a great document out there online and it's called How Safe is a Schoolhouse? It is produced by a woman named Jessica Butler, who's in Virginia. And she updates this about every, every couple of years. And it contains kind of a summary of different state laws and protections uh, for all of the states in, in the United States. So if you're interested in particular policies, it's a great place to start. And of course, you're always welcome to connect with me as well. So with all that said, th there's a problem. There's a problem out there. And the problem is that we're using these interventions that are, that are designed for crisis situations. We're using them in many situations that don't evolve, involve crisis. And these interventions can lead to significant trauma, injury, and death. Um, so, you know, my belief is that we can do better. And when I started on this journey, one of my first stops was to advocate for change at our local school system. And I'm, I'm very happy to report that I was successful in working with the school system and other organizations. And we implemented a new policy and new training. And I just got data yesterday and our seclusions and restraints have dropped dramatically. Seclusion will be completely banned as of the end of this school year. Um, but we went from, and, and the numbers are, are approximate, but we went from about 700 um, seclusions and 500 restraints to about 70 of each over the last reporting cycle, uh, which represents a school year. Um, a significant difference by bringing in the appropriate training, changing the mindset and changing the culture. So I'm a firm believer that we can do better. And I'm also a firm believer if we can do better, we need to. I mean, these are children that we're talking about and we are affecting their future. So how do we do that moving forward? Well, first, you know, I, I wanna be very clear that our organization, we, we are made up of parents, of self-advocates, of advocates, attorneys, teachers, administrators, all of us need to work together towards a solution. We are an, an not at all anti-educator or anti-teacher. Um, you know, we want to help make schools safer for everyone. And we recognize that, you know, people don't get an education because they think, oh, gee, I want to restrain and seclude a child. Um, you know, are there bad actors out there sometimes? Absolutely. They're there in all settings in life. But I think for the most part, uh, we have people that come into these settings. They're trained in a certain way. And that's what they do. Um, that's what we need to change. So nobody wants to do this. It puts everyone at risk. You know, again, when people restrain others, they're putting themselves at risk. There's got to be a better way. And my belief is, yes, there is. One of the first questions that I got asked very early in my process of advocating was, what else do you expect us to do? And at this point, I have a lot of good answers for that. When I was first asked that question, I didn't have the answer to that, frankly. Um, I knew what they were doing was wrong, but I didn't know what the right things to do were. And I began doing a lot of research on that and connecting with a lot of amazing individuals. And through that process have learned some of the things that we are recommending that people do. Oops. So what are, what are those things that we can do? One, we can practice, um, you know, we can practice things like universal design for learning. You know, we should be looking to accommodate all people in our society, regardless of differences, whether it may be neurodiversity or whatever differences that we have. And there are programs to do that. There are universal design for learning programs that are really different approaches that are flexible and, and have different ways to allow different types of students to engage in material and show what they know. Um, and if you follow these universal design for learning principles, you can develop lesson plans and activities that can really support all kids. And, and what we find is that Teachers that do this find that they develop much more approachable curriculums that work for everyone. It's, it's the analogy here is that sometimes things are done in the name of say disability. And sometimes those things 
benefit all people. And, you know, I think of a very simple example from the physical world, you know, something like the curb cut. While the curb cut might have been to help with accessibility for people in wheelchairs, well, gee, nobody thought about the mother with the baby stroller or the other things. We, we can design things in such a way that they're universally uh, supportive of people. So universal design for learning is one. The next is trauma-informed education and trauma-informed approaches. You know, what we find is that a lot of children are exposed to some trauma in their lifetime. Of course, there was the, the famous ACEs study, uh, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And, you know, what they found is that after, you know, a number of incidents, the, the impact of trauma would be much greater. But we have a lot of children coming to our schools each day that have a trauma history. And if you understand the influence that trauma has on the brain, you then can determine how do you appropriately support people. And a lot of the trauma sensitive approaches are based on relationships and understanding of trauma, the way it impacts the children and their families. Um, so there's a lot you can do with a, an approach that you, you take into account trauma and you build your program around that. The gentleman in the top right corner there with the young man, his name is Matthew Portell. Matthew is a principal at a school in Nashville called Fall, uh, Fall Hamilton Elementary. He became the principal in 2015. He came into that school with this idea of becoming a trauma-informed school. Trauma-informed has become a buzzword, but for Matthew, it was a mission. And he came into that school trying to figure out how he could do things like eliminating suspensions and expulsions, reducing restraint and seclusion. And he developed a trauma-informed program that now has enabled them to do just that, to eliminate suspension and expulsion, to reduce restraint and seclusion, to help better support teachers because a trauma-informed environment is not just about the kids, it's about the staff as well. So as an example, you know, if a teacher is becoming overwhelmed or has, has been having a difficult time or a hard time, she can actually use an app on her phone to tap out and have another teacher come re replace her for that time. There are a lot of things that he's done to try to make the whole uh, system more trauma-informed. And I'd welcome you to look up on YouTube, Matthew Portell and Trauma-Informed. There's a great piece that was done on Edutopia and Edutopia did a, about a nine minute um, video talking about the things they'd done at Fall Hamilton. Really, really impressive. So at any rate, you know, being sensitive to trauma, knowing that kids need to feel, you know, seen, safe, soothed and secured, knowing that relationships are critical for helping children. And on a side note, what is restraint and seclusion due to a relationship? It ruins it. You don't maintain a relationship you know, again, in, in, in abusing a child and restraining or secluding a child, um, you know, that's not, you know, my son still remembers to this day, the man that twice physically restrained him in the fifth grade. If he sees him, he has a visceral reaction. Um, you know, we've got to, we've got to support relationships. I, I often say um, that my, my three R's for education are relationship, relationship, relationship. It's so critical to helping kids succeed especially those with disabilities or trauma history that really need that support. So what else can we do? Well, related to trauma is understanding, you know, I don't expect teachers to be neurologists, but if you have a basic understanding of some of the neuroscience behind, behind trauma, behind adverse childhood experiences, behind how the brain processes trauma, um, you know, there's a, a great um, uh, professor and uh, teacher um, named Lori Desitels. Uh, she wrote a book called Connection Over Compliance. And she teaches a program actually at Butler University, which is a certificate on educational neuroscience. And in that, they talk not only about, you know, all of the, the background on the brain, but also helping to put kids in, in, in connection with their own brain state and understanding how they're feeling or reacting. And there's so much that we can do if we begin to understand the way our brains work and we can help teach others that as well. So how can we understand if, if we're becoming dysregulated? How can we help through co-regulation for, for kids to feel more grounded and better regulated? I'll tell you, you know, you, know, you often hear, while well, they were put in seclusion because they needed to calm down or regulate. Again, a, a solitary confinement cell is not a place to feel calmed down. Oops. So uh, another approach, and, and again, there are a lot of different approaches. I'm highlighting a few of them. Uh, one of the, the people that I respect really greatly is uh, Dr. Ross Green. Uh, Ross Green is a, a clinical psychologist. He developed a program called the Collaborative and Proactive Solutions Approach, and it's a trauma-informed, non-adversarial model. And it's really about um, 
you know, working with kids rather than doing things to kids. And, and Ross's core belief that the, the guiding principle behind the collaborative and practice solutions approach, and this is going to sound really simple, but his basic belief is kids do well if they can. And we can all shake our head and say, well, of course, kids do well if they can. But the difference there is that very often in our schools and in other environments, people think kids do well if they want to. And if you think that kids do well if they want to, when they're not doing well, you attribute it to a lack of motivation. You know, you attribute it to being defiant. You attribute it to attention seeking. You can attribute it to a lot of things, but you, you in, es in essence, offer either rewards or consequences to motivate behavior change. If you think that kids do well if they can, when they're not doing well, you ask questions like, why are they not doing well? What's getting in their way? Do they have a lagging skill? Do they have an unsolved problem? Because we can teach skills just like we can teach math and in, in English. We can teach skills to help kids overcome situations that are challenging for them. So his model really focuses on working with kids rather than doing things to kids and helping to come up with durable solutions. So again, there's a lot of different types of solutions out there. Uh, collaborative and proactive solutions is, is another one of them. Um, and of course, there are restorative restorative practices, restorative practice have gained a lot of attention in recent years. And these are programs that may use things like restorative circles. They're, they're about, um, you know, they're about, you know, making, um, you know, working with relationships and understanding how people uh, process things in a non-punitive way, but to understand how things affect each other and how our actions affect others. And these restorative practices and many reports have shown a lot of promising data about improving school climate and reducing, you know, um, adverse uh, discipline. And, you know, the, the question that no doubt comes up is, well, gee, these things are all great. Um, but what if, what if a crisis happens? And there are solutions for that as well. But I do want to say that, I, yes. We, should, we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, we can stay past the hour for people have questions, but if uh, I just wanted to give you a heads up. Okay. Yeah, I, I have had a plan on time for questions. I thought they had said 75 minutes. So um, I, I'm wrapping up. Won't be too much longer here. Great. Okay. Um, so at any rate, I wanted to point out that there are alternative crisis management approaches. Ukeru is one of them. It is something that was developed by a place called Grafton, uh, Grafton Integrated Health. They ran a lot of uh, non-public or residential facilities in Virginia. And like everyone else, 15 years ago, they used a lot of restraint and seclusion. In fact, so much so that they were going to lose their workman's compensation insurance because of the number of injuries. They had a new CEO came in and they said, this is not right. We've got to do better. They challenged the staff to come up with a better approach. They ultimately developed something called Ukero, which is a trauma-informed alternative to restraint and seclusion. Uh, with Ukero, the, the focus is on avoiding trauma, avoiding escalation in the first place. But if you cannot, they use a series of pads in their training, not in a way that would be offensive. So if a child becomes, you know, um, escalated, the pads are used to protect the staff while at the same time trying to de-escalate the child. So with the Ocaro method, rather than, you know, defensively tackling the child to the ground, you would use the pad to protect yourself while simultaneously trying to help them to regulate. Because the moment you put arms around a child, you're escalating the situation. Anyway, um, it's an option out there and there's a lot of other things we can do. I want to point out the safety myth though. People often think in schools that they need these interventions to keep themselves safe. And what in fact we find is the data shows the opposite. Whenever you put hands on a child, whenever you restrain or seclude, you are increasing the likelihood of injury. Uh, you're increasing the likelihood of even death. Grafton's long-term data showed that. In fact, they showed not only when they reduced and eliminated, they eliminate seclusion completely, reduce restraint to almost non-existent numbers. And they found that uh, they not only um, did that, but they saved money, they increased staff satisfaction, decreased staff turnover and staff injury. So safety, um, the safety myth is sometimes used, but it's a non-issue non here. And I do wanna point out just real quickly as we wrap up that you know, the, the thing that we often hear is, well, gee, you know, we, we don't have money, we don't have time, we don't have resources, we can't do new training. And I'll tell you, from my experience, even one teacher can make a difference for a classroom. You know, when you begin to focus on, on relationships and, and models that support kids, there's a lot you can do. And there's a lot of resources out there. I met a teacher named Karen Blatcher, who she had a story in Good Morning America about her approach to teaching her classroom. All of her students were neurotypical, 
but she taught the classroom as if they were um, autistic. And she used a lot of the same things, like she had mindfulness and emotional literacy and fidgets. And, and what she found is all her students thrived. And, and what she said was that, you know, that when you treat, um, when you treat anybody, and this gets back to the universal design, like you should treat somebody that has autism, everybody can thrive and prosper. So there are things that we can do that benefit everyone. A couple quick book recommendations, and then we'll wrap up. If you're interested in learning more about the things we can do or the why behind this, uh, Dr. Ross Green's Lost at School is an excellent resource. I also highly recommend Mona Della Hook's Beyond Behaviors. Uh, gets into understanding that not all behavior is volitional, that there's behavior that happens uh, because it goes into what's called the polyvagal theory, but it has to do with, you know, when you don't feel safe, your threat detection system goes on high and your behaviors are driven by your amygdala where it's fight, flight, or survive. Uh, there's another great one I mentioned earlier, Dr. Lori Desitel's Connection Over Compliance, uh, which is a great look at how important relationships are and understanding the brain. So with that, there's a lot of other great resources, some of which I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, the body keeps the score, the boy who was raised as a dog, you know, things that go into trauma, uh, punished by rewards is another great one from uh, Alfie Cohen. So a lot of great resources out there. I just want to say that, that I really believe that we can do better. And if we can do better, that we must do better. And I will say that, you know, at its, at its best, restraint and seclusion are tools that are well-intentioned but misguided and do a lot of harm. At their worst, they're abuse. So we can do better and I, and I really believe that we need to do better. So with that, I will open it up to any questions that we might have. And I appreciate uh, everyone that's been on the, the line here. And if you've got to get off now that we're at the hour mark, I understand. Uh, but I welcome any questions or comments and I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen here so I can see everyone and uh, thank you. And okay, just... are there any questions? No question, just a comment. I think that uh, this is something that AppSec should be looking into very seriously. I've set up a little note there in uh, chat. Dave Corwin and I talked about this uh, at uh, the uh, Utah conference, along with, uh, I think it um, was uh, Susan from um, uh, California's CAPSEC. We really do need to take a position. This is child abuse. There's no question about mm -hmm. it. As many of you know, I represent the family of Max Benson and the other six no. kids uh, who've been restrained there. And frankly, uh, I have to tell you that when I was a uh, police officer learning about what they used to do with kids in the 1800s, uh, when I first heard about this case, I said, where are we? Mm -hmm. uh, this, we're going backwards, not, not forwards. Well, APSAC will be voting to sign on to the federal legislation, and hopefully we will be doing that in the January board meeting. Yeah, and Seth, I appreciate your, your comment as well. And, um, you know, I've been trying to connect with other individuals and organizations that are doing, you know, similar work. And, and, and while, you know, missions may be somewhat different, I think we're aligned in a lot of beliefs. And I am happy to do anything I can to, to further, um, you know, the cause here and always happy to speak to anyone, meet with anyone, anyone that will listen, I will talk to, because I, I really do believe that there's so much better we should be doing. Like you said, um, when, when I heard restraint and seclusion, I mean, I, in a school context, I just couldn't believe it. I wouldn't have imagined it happening. And then when I looked behind the curtain and see, saw the damage and how often it happens, I was just appalled. And you know, this, uh, you know, I, I have a full-time job at a, the a university when I started this. I still have a full-time job, but I now have kind of two full-time jobs is my joke. Uh, you know, I had a great conversation with Mel about that and all, all the priorities that, that we all have. But this is really, really important to me. And if there's anything I can do to help in anyone's work here, I would encourage you. I'm happy to speak to any other group or any other individuals. Well, that, I think the further thing that AppSec needs to look at is the fact that when professionals respond to these, including the officers who repeatedly went to the school involved in my case, they wrote it off as it was discipline and right. it was justified. They didn't investigate any farther. Uh, the Department of Education in California didn't investigate until Max died. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, there was a, com a complaint that was made that required uh, an immediate response, eight, uh, 10 days, uh, immediately prior to uh, his being killed. So um, this, again, I think is, uh, it, it's not just a matter of signing on to legislation. I think uh, we, as a multidisciplinary organization, uh, remembering that uh, that's what we do is uh, we take 
uh, things across all disciplines. We need to train those people who are involved in this to take it beyond simply the educational aid that it is uh, labeled as uh, when these things happen to find out whether or not uh, the kids are, well, let me say that, whether or not, that, that it's clear that what they're doing is abusive. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And of course, the, the, the federal guidance has always been clear that these things should never be used for discipline. Like, but like you said, you know, the, the police would come, well, it was discipline. So you, know, you, you can't have it both ways there. I mean, these were really intended to be crisis interventions, but there, there are so much better things we can be doing that, that shouldn't. I mean, what happened to Max? What happened to Cornelius? These things should never have happened. Um, so any, anything I can do to support the work at, at APSAC or anywhere else, please, I, I'm happy to, and, and I can be reached, uh, my email can be distributed to the group as well. Any other questions or comments? I, I, I have I, a question, yeah, Guy. Absolutely. Thank mm -hmm. you very much for your presentation. It's very timely in terms of APSAC's, uh, you know, maybe through your efforts and connection to mm -hmm. Stacey LeBlanc, uh, learning about this proposed federal legislation. I'm, I'm wondering, do you know, uh, what the thoughts on this legislation from the, the National School Psychologists Association. There's 25,000 school right, psychologists. Right. I saw a letter that expressed concerns about restraint and seclusion in schools from them. But. Uh, I, I'd have to double check because I'm not recalling off the top of my head. We, we had a couple of groups that have signed on in support of the legislation. Historically, we've seen groups like the Superintendents Association that's been very anti-legislation. So they have can, they have contended that you know teachers need these tools and need the right to be able to restrain and seclude kids. Uh, I th I, I don't want to misspeak, but one of these organizations did sign on to the bill that surprised me. And I want, I want to think it was the, the Association of School Psychologists. Um, I've been trying to talk to other organizations as well and encourage them to potentially sign on also. The American Bar Association came out with a statement recently, uh, and they're going to sign on to it also, which represents also a lot of the attorneys in the school context. Um, but I'd have to double check because I don't recall what their position was. Uh, some of the unions have been people to come out against this legislation. And, and some of it's very misguided. It's under the belief that we need these interventions to keep people safe. When in fact, again, what we see time and time again is using these interventions puts people at greater risk. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I don't have a specific. I wanted to pull it up here. But if you pull up the um, press release from Don... Uh, uh, Bobby Scott, uh, which has the complete list of who had signed on to it. And I've been working hard to try to get some other organizations to sign on as well. Um, that mentioned two organizations that were school-based organizations. I just don't remember which ones they were. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions or comments? If not, uh, Guy, let me thank you so much for an excellent presentation and for educating APSAC uh, and professionals across the country. Uh, I just want to say that you, your son is a very fortunate to have you as a father. And uh, again, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for uh, being here and, and listening. And especially Guy, thank you for taking such a negative thing and making something positive from it. Yeah, I, I'm hoping to do that. I mean, it, it is hard. Um, and, you know, I, I work with a number of people on our team that have been through this. We, we've all been through this trauma. But the point is, it, it's we've got to move beyond being angry and upset to how can we, you know, how can I make sure I, I, it's not going to happen to my son again, I can assure you. But how can I make sure that it doesn't happen to others? Because, you know, it's been hard for all of us. So, um, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. And, and thank you all again. And, and do not hesitate to connect. I'm happy to continue to figure out ways to work with the organization and, and other individuals that are doing this work. And don't worry, Seth, we're gonna be working with Guy in the future. Very good, thanks, Mel. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.